And welcome to episode 402 of Geek Town Radio. I'm your host, Dave, and I'm back this week with... To infinity and beyond! Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing good, David. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. It's been a couple of weeks since you've been on. What have you been up to? First of all, it was good to be on the 400th episode. It was great. That was uh, very eventful, and that was really, really cool. Yeah. Apart from that, I- I've decided to actually put these from uh, worst to best these these three things that I'm going to be mentioning here I just thought I'd do it a little bit differently uh, War of the Worlds is the f- is the first of those so I finished the third season mm-hmm. uh, we don't know if there's a fourth we need a fourth season but I don't know that I want one <laughs> <laughs> it started off alright and then I don't know because you've got this one you've got the one main sort of character and he basically knows everything that's going on because of the timey wimeyness of what's happened mm-hmm. following from the end of the previous season and he's sounding like you know a madman half the season try to, trying to explain this timey wimey thing to people and he eventually gets some help from some people and then there's some other timey wimey stuff that goes on but for the most part in like the first half of the season it makes sense as to what What's going on and you as a, as a viewer knowing what's happened and knowing that he is telling the truth that connects quite nicely and then you get this like separate group that's in orbit in sort of space they're on this like space station sort of thing and they're trying to communicate with people on the ground and that progresses nicely so i remember when i came on to geek town not the 400th episode the one before that i think i'd mentioned that i was about halfway through the season i remember saying you know it was it was doing pretty good it wasn't as good as like the first or second season but it was doing some good stuff and then just just some other stuff kind of happens and it's sort of like starts spiraling a little spiraling a little bit and stop sort of not that it didn't make sense but it just could have been better than than what it was and we don't know if there's a fourth season obviously there's all sorts of things that have happened in the world and and whatnot and then the season ended and it gives you these kinds of i'll call them pieces not really scenes but well they are scenes but pieces of kind of this is where this character is this is where this character is and showing you where they are Mm -hmm. but i wouldn't call many of them and especially what i would call the main two scenes that they have i wouldn't really call them endings at all and they're kind of very sort of hey here's what's happening with this character what's your interpretation of that and i don't mind the whole what's your interpretation style as long as there's like better sort of answers but it's sort of okay i understand what's happening to these characters but that's not really a way to take an ending for those for their stories Mm -hmm. so i almost just want sort of like one more episode or something just to kind of (laughs) okay definitive definitive and it wasn't really like cancel cliffhanger type scenarios that they were sort of these scenes are laid out in sort of some of these characters are at peace some of them have died and all these sorts of things but for the actual end and it might not be the ending maybe they have got a full season plan we we haven't really heard a lot about it but it's also been i think about i think this was last year in june this was that sort of clog of tv that we had last year in june and we haven't really heard anything since then so i can't really take it as sort of oh yeah that's the ending of the series that's fine it it was very much a season finale if if anything and as much as I really, really enjoyed season one and two and thought season three, if season three is very different. I don't know if I want another eight episodes. I don't know if it really needs that much. It just needs like a little end point. So have you seen this third season yet or, or are you still? Uh... I kind of know what you're saying because I sort of started with it. I mean, I really struggled to get back into it. In this third... Yeah, it starts yeah. off strange, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just really struggle to get back into it, so I keep on forgetting it's there now. And, I, you know, I've tried to sort of pick it up again, and then I, I'm just not engaged with it like I was with some of the other seasons. So, um, I mean, I do sort of want to go back and, and watch the rest of it but as you say at the moment we've no idea whether it's going to come back or not it's not being cancelled or renewed right now so mm. I, yeah I don't know yeah just do like a streaming film to for that. that's right. all it kind of yeah. needs really so yeah. but we'll see again love the first two seasons and this third season isn't bad it's just a lot different and also just ends in a very just oh okay sort of way so yeah 
uh, I went to watch uh, something on ITVX. Yes, I remembered that it was there, <laughs> which is uh, a thing. Uh, Love and Death, which is what I, I watched, which is the Elizabeth Olsen, Jesse Plemons series uh, about a, a true story and stuff. So it's got seven episodes. Obviously, it's a limited series. It won't be coming back. And the reason I checked this out, first of all, was I saw, oh, Elizabeth Olsen is in a HBO or Max or whatever we're calling it at the moment. I think yeah. it was HBO Max when it actually, it, it when was. this series came out. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not sure whether they turned it over to Max. It was certainly HBO Max when they commissioned it. Anyway. Yeah, that was what the logo was. So I thought, oh, that that in itself, like, okay, high production, you know, HBO is still doing some good stuff. And Elizabeth Olsen, she's good and everything. Jesse Plemons, that sounds very good. And I didn't really know a whole lot about this actual true story and stuff. Um, and obviously they've adapted bits and things like that. So this is seven episodes. The shortest episode is about 50 minutes or so. <laughs> I think this could have been a film. This yeah. was, it, it was, it, in the parts where it was good and it actually picked up the pace a little bit, it was really, really good. And this isn't sort of HBO putting out something bad. It's just putting out something that had a lot more time than what it needed. <laughs> yes. And it was like, I got to episodes four and then five and I was like, oh, I've still got three or so left. And then that sort of dragged things out a bit. Um, it, it was great in the moments that it was good. It just, yeah, I really just <laughs> found it to be very, it didn't help, of course, because there was, there was adverts and that made things a bit longer. It also didn't help to see trailers for Big Brother. <laughs> so, But no, that uh, never helps. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to sign up for the whole free thing magic because I, I, kn- I knew I wasn't going to use ITV afterwards anyway so right the best thing about it is the performances which was kind of what I was expecting you know you put people like Kristen Ritter uh, Jesse Plemons Elizabeth Olsen they've all been in, um, on a number of really good things uh, two of which of course on Breaking Bad and obviously uh, Elizabeth from the MCU and some other stuff so on an acting showcase front it was really really excellent that was sort of some of what I was there for the story itself is fine it is pretty sort of straightforward and it sort of goes through that and it does tell that very well it's just given far too much time for it so have you seen this then i haven't no i kind of looked at it and thought that looks like it might be kind of interesting but i had suspicions that it might have been one of those things that they dragged out over more episodes than it needed to be Mm -hmm. so i'd avoided (laughs) it and I, i think i read some reviews of it that were kind of middling and i thought well i might go and look at it but i it's not really leap out at me necessarily so and I, like you, forget that ITVX is there sometimes. So it's rare that I actually go and click on it, which is the usual problem with these things. <laughs> yeah. Last thing I finished, I finally caught up with The Handmaid's Tale, the fifth season? Yes. Fourth? Fifth, fifth, something like that. Fifth, I think. Yeah. This feels like it's had 10 seasons. Like, I know. It does. It feels like so much stuff has happened. So it's still got the problem, and, and I get why it does do it. It, it is still very, very self-indulgent at, at a lot of points, and it's been like that the whole way through. It's sort of part of Hamid's Tell's DNA. I think what while this show is it, is sort of due to end, and you know we'll sort of just want to get there, and I've wanted to get there in terms of you know seeing these characters, particularly June, just finally have peace after just everything that's happened. I think this season had the best content, specifically this stuff between Serena and June, and I'm not going to spoil it, obviously, still, but just everything that happens there, particularly that one episode later on in the season, that was a really good way for them to kind of, instead of just kind of doing the same thing over and over again, which Handmaid's Tale did get into a bit of a loop of, and that was where, you know, some people got a bit tired of it, and I understand that. You finally kind of move, it's still reflected on like those sorts of moments and scenes, but you've, the show finally managed to kind of move past that somewhat and actually reflect on it in a better way with the scenes between these two characters. And I thought that was probably some of the best stuff that Handmaid's Tale has done. So, so while it's a case of another 10 episodes to go through and then another final season after this and then see what this spin-off's about, while, while there's still some of it to go, I felt like it put out some of its best content in this season. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really good end to the season as well. Once you get to the end of the season, you kind of realise, okay, there's still obviously the Handmaid's Tale stuff in there and still the Gilead parts and, and those sorts of things but it finally feels like it's at least moving forward a bit which I guess if you're heading towards your final season you do need to move forward at some point so I don't know if this was like my favourite or sort of best season but in terms of this, some of the stories that they do especially between those two characters I thought was some of its best stuff so far you finished this a while ago didn't you? Yeah so. I enjoyed the season as well I, as you say it gets very self-indulgent in places which is its biggest problem but overall I did enjoy this 
season. I do think it is at a point where they need to wrap it up. So I'm kind of glad they announced the next season is the last season. Yeah. So aside from that, what have what have you been doing? Well, I mean, there's the Loki series, of course, which is still running on Disney Plus. We got a, a return of an old face in the latest episode, which was interesting to see in a slightly different version of of that character. I'm enjoying it. It is running at a sort of hundred miles an hour, and I think it's quite <laughs> fun. As we were talking about with Bex last week, it is really packing a lot into sort of 40 minute, 50 minute episodes. But I love the bouncing backwards and forwards between the characters. I think it is one of the stronger things that they've done for MCU TV shows in a while. So overall, I am quite enjoying the series so far. Yeah, I've been enjoying it as well. Obviously, there's a lot of timey wimey stuff going on, which is pretty standard. It was good to see that person back as well. We know about obviously all the variants and different things. I was kind of wondering when they'd pop back up and what that would even look like. Of course, we're dealing with somebody who's supposed to be different to Thanos, which is the whole point. That was quite good. But yeah, we're halfway through and I'm curious to see kind of where it goes. It's interesting that you've been able to choose Loki for for this show. And like you know, we have to remember that this is a developed version of the 2012 Loki that tried to steal obviously yes. the Tesseract from uh, the first or the second Avengers film. The first one, yes. yes. Um, of course, he's the, the villain in that one. Rather than the one that survives till later because that version is not around anymore but hey you still get Loki so that's that's quite cool because I don't know really that many other characters in the MCU would fit the slot of the particular thing they're trying to do with Loki so I think that's been been kind of an interesting choice but yeah, I'm just curious to see what they'll do with um, Kang and how like the different variant stuff will work as well because mm-hmm. uh, as we know from Ant-Man and the Wasp there's like basically unlimited versions of him I mean that's the whole idea behind the model us right is as unlimited versions of everybody just like we saw over the years with wells on the flash you yes. just bring in another one so um we'll, we'll see where it goes yeah but i've been enjoying it so far i think they've been doing a good job with it so far uh, i thought this episode was was pretty solid i don't know where they're going to end this series because they're sort of dealing with the fallout of the end of the last series with messing around with the timeline and the fact that it's wildly out of control at the moment so i think it's been good though so far so i am enjoying that gaming wise i think i'm at a point that i'm actually going to put starfield down after about 300 hours so (laughs) i've done a couple of new game pluses with it you may or may not be aware with starfield with the normal new game plus which is where you kind of get to play through again but keeping some of your progress the new game plus in starfield is actually built into the story so it's a bit more encouraging you to go through the new game plus and i've i've done a couple of those couple of iterations of those as well as playing through the main story a couple of times as well so i'm sort of at a point where i think i'm probably going to leave it until things have settled and they've got some expansions out and and that sort of thing i may kind of walk away from a bit and also because city skylines 2 comes out today as well so i will be diving into that i have been messing around a bit with cyberpunk 2077 in the sort of interim period since i put starfield down because they have an expansion pack out called phantom liberty which i haven't started yet because it's been so long since i played the original cyberpunk and there's a massive 2.0 update for it as well and there's been other bits and pieces so i kind of thought you know what i'm just going to play through it from the start again because that's what they recommended actually cd project red (laughs) right okay because i played through it once when it first came out and that was all good but I kind of left it ever since then. So I'm going kind of back into it almost completely fresh because I've forgotten a lot of the plot points and bits and pieces. Starting it again from scratch, I will be breaking off that though to go and play City Skylines 2. But overall, enjoying jumping back into that as well. Starfield itself, it's a great basis for a game and there are lots of things you can do do in that game i had a lot of fun with it but for a game that's been in development for what almost 10 years you kind of think this doesn't feel like they've quite finished it there are so many dangling plot threads of things 
that you know you'll start you'll have a conversation with somebody like there's a bunch of companions which are part of constellation the explorer group that you initially join and there are a bunch of other named companions that you can pick up along the way who are sort of secondary companions that you can use to put on your ship and help you out with things and that sort of stuff and the secondary companions they've got lovely bits of sort of conversation you can have with those that add texture to the game but in those conversations they'll express sort of aspirations of the fact that they want to explore the galaxy or they mention something like one guy mentions that you know he's got a family on a particular planet and they sort of feel like they should lead up to little quests of that of you to go and take them with you to explore somewhere or you know in take them to visit their family and there's no follow through on any of that and I mean, the conversations are fine as sort of conversations, but you sort of feel like, well, they didn't take that to its logical conclusion. And there's so many points in that game where they've not taken it to its logical conclusion. Like, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that you have companions so you can romance them and you can get married to some of them. But there is a perk that you can get for your character called Kid Stuff, which puts your parents in the game. So you get visited by your parents every so often, and you can go and visit them, and they live in this apartment. But when you get married, you can't invite the parents to the wedding. And even if you go there with your then wife afterwards, or husband afterwards, there is no way to make any reference to the fact that this is your partner, even though when you first go home, your mother asks if you've got anybody special. You know, so it's like there's just no follow through in so many of the world building. So it sort of feels like they ran out of time, which is weird given the thing has been going for like 10 years. It's not that what what is there is bad. In fact, what is there is really good fun. I mean, I've put, as I say, almost 300 hours into it. I really, really enjoy playing what's there. It's well worth it. Go and get it. It is a great fun game. But there are points which you look at and go that's a really odd decision that they've not finished off that thought you know <laughs> mm, yeah you've not jumped into this yet have you i did for about a couple of hours and i i, I wasn't really a fan of that's right what yeah. was there and this does feel like another cyberpunk slash no man's sky where like okay we'll meet if we come back to this in three years it will be the finished game well not really the finished game but the full game because I, I totally understand what you mean and that there was this things i noticed when i was playing that didn't really they feel like the idea was there but it didn't really feel fully sort of complete i personally i carried on with um lies of p after i did that right, yeah. which i got past a really difficult boss which was good to do and uh, today i'm going to start spider-man 2 so that's ah, my uh, gaming side of things yes so. i would play spider-man 2 but i don't have a ps5 so <laughs> right. starfield i would recommend it as a game but there are some really bizarre decisions in there that will had you looking at it going, why is that like that? Like, why is that done that way? That doesn't make the most logical sense. It got eight out of 10 reviews in a number of places and people were kind of going, oh, that seems, so yeah, it should be a 10 out of 10 game. And no, I think that is fair as an eight out of 10 game. It is by no means a bad game. It's a fun time. I very much enjoyed it. I'm also very interested to see what it looks like five years from now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is going to be a lot going on with Starfield for years to come, I suspect. But the base game is enjoyable, but it does feel like a base game. On the TV side of things, I've been watching through Cobra Rebellion, which is the um, political drama that is on Sky with Robert Carlyle in the lead role as the Prime Minister. Rebellion is the third season and it is based around the fact that the government are building this high-speed rail underground and it's going through a village and there's a bunch of eco-protesters that are trying to stop it and things go badly wrong at the site. That's all I'll sort of say about it at this point. I really rather enjoy what they're doing with it. It's a good, solid political thriller. It's got a great cast. Robert Carlyle, Victoria Hamilton, Jane Horrocks, who is a sort of key character in this season as well. But um, yeah, good, solid drama. It is all up on Sky On Demand and on Now, if you want to go and catch it there. But uh, that's the third season of Cobra. I started watching the Frasier revival as well, which is on 
on Paramount Plus, which is really interesting because, I mean, these revival things can go various ways, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of shows that they've tried to uh, tried to sort of bring back. This one follows Frazier back to Boston because he was in Seattle for many, many years. It's just following the death of his father who uh, has passed away and he's come back to Boston to sort of start a new chapter in his life, trying to reconnect with his son, ends up lecturing at a university and it's pretty much a sort of you know just continuation of the tv series kelsey grammar's great as Frasier. you've got an interesting new cast around him they've roped in nicholas lindhurst the well-known british actor uh, mm-hmm. who plays yeah, rodney. yes rodney who plays alan cornwell who is a friend of Frasier's from college and he's also a very lazy professor at harvard working in the same department as Frasier. and they're sort of friends but you know very very different in terms of characters you've got tox all Lundy, I think her name is, who is the the head of the department, who is great as well. Jake Cutmore Scott, who plays Freddie Crane, Fraser's son. Anders Keith, who plays David Crane, who is the son of Niles and Daphne. And then there's Eve, who is Freddie's friend, who is uh, who lives across the hall from them. It's sort of an interesting setup because they've not directly replaced the characters that are missing from the original show. So, like Niles' this son isn't really a direct replacement of Niles and Alan Cornwell isn't really a direct replacement of Niles Nicholas Linter's character which I think some people assumed that might be the role that he fills there are elements of Niles in David Crane Fraser's nephew and Niles's kid but he's not a direct carbon copy but there are hints of him there which you'd expect because it's Niles's child and with Fraser's son Freddie who is a firefighter there are elements of the grandfather because he sort of fits into that role but it's not anywhere near a sort of identical because the dynamic is different because Fraser's the father and he's the kid so they've done a nice job of making it sort of familiar but different kind of massage this interesting new group around them it's got three episodes out at the moment I've been really quite enjoying it there's 10 episodes in the first season if you like the original Fraser, I think you'll probably like this as well but I think they've done a decent job with it so far did you ever watch any of Frasier? Because, I mean, they ran it endlessly on Channel 4 for years. Yeah, I remember coming across those. I've seen, like, chunks of episodes, but I've not seen it properly, you know, mm-hmm. from the pilot or something. I remember liking what I saw, though, although it's been a long time since I sort of caught one of those reruns. Sounds kind of interesting. It's good to see, obviously, Nicholas Lindhurst again uh, since Fools and Horses and stuff. Obviously, he's done other bits yeah. since then. Like, that was a, a long time ago. But no, it sounds uh, it, it sounds good. Um, but no, I'd, obviously, if I was to jump into this, I'd rather go back from the pilot and then do it all properly. Yeah, and there's a lot of the original Frasier to get through. Uh, mm. I'd say. How, many, how many seasons were there? Was it like an eight or ten season thing? Eleven seasons. Oh. And there were 24 oh. episode seasons as well. So there's a lot to get through if you go back to the original. I mean, if you want to really follow the character, you've got to go through the whole of Cheers before that as well, because that's where the character came from. So, I mean, it's a character that Kelsey Grammer has been playing for a very, very, very long time. I mean, basically his entire career. I do think they've done a decent enough job with this. It doesn't fall as flat as some of the revival things have done. Certainly, I think, one to take a look at. And the other thing that I've been watching is a show called Bodies, which is on Netflix. This I've been really rather enjoying. Bodies is a crime drama with a twist. It's actually based on a graphic novel by Cy Spencer. And it's got a really good cast. The setup for it, there are four detectives who are in four different time periods of London, but they find themselves investigating the same murder, which is an unidentified body that lands in a particular street in Whitechapel. But in every time era, the body appears to be absolutely identical. And... It's then this sort of conspiracy theory that lasts sort of 150 years. It's 1890s, 1940s, and 2010s, so the sort of key time periods. I don't really want to give much more away than that at this point, other than you've got this intriguing sort of murder of seemingly the same body appearing in these various different time periods. It's written by Paul Tollerlin, who wrote on No Offence and Shameless and Torch, 
Edgewood. So decent CV behind him. The directors behind it worked on things like the Lazarus Project and Doctor Who. So it's good directing team. It's a really solid series. I'm one episode to the end. So what I can't tell you is whether they managed to land the ending or not. But it's eight episodes. The seven I've seen so far, I've been really quite enjoying and uh, keeps you guessing on to sort of how the crime things are connecting and all this sort of stuff. It's called Bodies. It's on Netflix right now. It's eight episodes. I would say it is worth going to check out. If you like crime thrillers, I think this is certainly one that I would suggest you go and check out. Bodies on Netflix. Go and take a look at that. So is that a limited series or does it need to be renewed? That is a limited series as well. Okay. So right. you've also got the advantage that Netflix can't cancel it because it's a limited <laughs> series. Yeah, that's what we hope for now. So, yes, yeah. sadly true. So that's all the stuff we've been watching this week. Let's move on to some TV and film news. So we kick off the TV and film news with the Nils cancellations and pickups. Elite on Netflix has been cancelled. Uh, well, ending, I think, is probably fairer because it's done eight seasons, which is fairly substantial for Netflix. It's the uh, Spanish series, but that mm. is coming to it's an end. It's very popular. It like, is when extremely popular. I see people popular. talking about it, they really, really love it. Yeah. But I've, I've not personally jumped on it. Neither have I. Not so much cancelled as ending, I think, that it has been given a proper final season. BBC have cancelled Doctors after 23 years, which is the daytime drama slash soap slash serialised medical thing. They're basically saying that it's a cost-cutting measure. It sounds like the facilities that they shoot doctors in is falling to bits and it needs mm-hmm. refurbishing and they were looking at the numbers for it and they just said it's just not practical for us to completely refurbish the place and keep the show running. It just doesn't make any sense. Mm. So unfortunately, they've said that they're ending it after 23 years. The money that they are saving by not doing that, because it's shot in the Midlands, they are plowing that money back into other projects within the Midlands. So the money will be actually staying local. It's just the show will unfortunately be going. And Mm. whilst I've never watched it, it is well known as a training ground, not only for actors, but also for directors and writers. And I mean, I'm sure there'll be other shows that will do that. And do you know how we say like every Australian actor comes through Neighbours or Home and Away? Right, yeah. Much. So factors can tend to do that, yeah. Yeah, Doctors is very much something that did the same sort of thing in the UK. So like early TV spots for Eddie Redmayne, Richard Armitage, Nicholas Holt, even before he went and did About a Boy, Tom Ellis, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Claire Foy, Amelia Clark, all people that got one of their early acting gigs oh, wow. was in Doctors. Some big names there. Yeah, I mean, people that have gone on to being huge, huge things. And it's it's the same with people that have shot behind the camera as well. It's very much being a training ground for people. So from that point of view, I will be very sorry to see it go because I think it shows like this are quite important because you need places like this where people can get a foothold and learn some mm. of their craft yeah. to, to move on to other things. It's funny when we get to like the Soap Awards each year, arguably the big ones are kind of EastEnders and it's debatable what the other one sort of is it one of well, the ITV ones Corey probably or, yeah, yeah yeah then you've got Emmerdale then you've got Hollyoaks there and Doctor's always kind of felt like that extra fifth one and yeah. usually a genuine sort of surprise when they pick something up but it's sort of like oh they picked up a little best storyline or, or, or something like that obviously there's a lot of different awards I know it's kind of one that was on the side a bit more but it will be sad to kind of like not have it around at all anymore because where you have these on at sort of seven eight ish o'clock the, these sort of soaps you used to air at sort of two in the afternoon yeah, and it's I, a daytime I know soap. that yeah yeah and i know that people can catch up on iplayer and that sort of thing but it might affect its live ratings and that might have i don't know it, well, it, I, it was it, it was always kind of one that was just just a bit more on the outside to yeah i mean to, it, to all the other ones it so. isn't it isn't one of the so, one of the evening soaps it's a daytime soap which means it comes out of the daytime budget which is a slightly different pot of money um mm-hmm. it is a lot cheaper to produce and have a lot less spent on it than something like eastenders but it had a very interesting function in that although it was enjoyable for audiences they enjoyed it for what it was because neighbors used to air in that sort of time slot as well as airing sort of Mm -hmm. you know 6 p.m or something it was something that was sort of in that sort of soapy kind of 
time slot. But it had this interesting extra function of being this kind of training ground for people getting into the industry. So I'm sure something else will come along and pick that up. I mean, prior to Doctors, the things like The Bill used to be a place where, you oh, know, yeah. when that was still yeah. around, that was a place where people used to pop up. And I mean, it's the same with some of the soaps as well. You know, people do pop up in parts in, in sort of guest runs and stuff on some of the bigger soaps or Hollyoaks as well. <laughs> it's something where people kind of pop up in and then go on to do other stuff. Either that or they go from EastEnders to Hollyoaks back to EastEnders and maybe <laughs> cup up on, yeah. on another one or something. But even that being said, with how small Doctors is and stuff, 23 years is nothing to laugh no. at. That's a heck of a long time to be able to still no. stay on TV. So it did very well. It did. And as I say, I'm sure something else will come along. Do you think anybody else will pick it up? No, I don't think that's likely at all. Not like a neighbour's situation. I don't see that particularly as being likely, but mm. I think something else will probably come along. I don't know what exactly they're planning to do with the money other than they've said it's staying in the West Midlands, whether that will get ploughed into another drama or whether that will get ploughed into other projects within the West Midlands. I don't know. As I say, sad to see it go just because of the outweighted importance it had as a training programme more than anything else. Moving on to Channel 4, they've cancelled Steph's Pat Lunch. That's after three seasons, so that has gone. Over in America, Transplant the medical drama that is coming to an end after four seasons that's actually a canadian show it's sort of shared between ctv in canada and nbc i think we've had two seasons of it over here and i don't think the third one has ever actually aired it was on sky witness i think so i don't know whether they're going to wear the third season or not but it's apparently ending on season four and the problem with john stewart which was the apple tv plus series which he did apparently was being geared up for a season three then apple have now dropped it because of creative differences between john and apple it sounds like the problem was that if you've not seen the problem with john stewart he basically tackles a specific subject each week so it's the problem with war the problem with the stock market and the things that he was looking at for the new season were ai and china and you can sort of see why Apple maybe is slightly uncomfortable with him laying into things like that because they have quite an involvement in both. So I think the problem was that Apple were trying to overstep and trying to say, oh, no, you can't do that. And he basically went, screw you, and decided Apple was probably not the best place for him. Unfortunate that, but you don't mess with Jon Stewart. He's a man with a lot of integrity <laughs> and kind of a bit disappointed in Apple if that is the case. And they actually were trying to stop him from producing things. But hopefully Jon Stewart pops up somewhere else because, I mean, he's great. And uh, I would like to see him back on TV regularly again. But that has gone. I take it you didn't see any of those. No, I'm guessing this is one of them like talk show sort of... Yeah, things. very much the sort of daily yeah, show yeah. kind of kind right. of thing. Um, or, Can, or last can't week he just go and do the same thing for a different channel then? Yeah, I mean, absolutely he could if somebody will pay him to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he could do it on YouTube probably. That, that, well, yeah, is, just, is, this, that would be quite easy, yeah, I suppose. The show was pretty good. I don't think it was as good as some of the other stuff that's out there, which is a shame because, I mean, John is great. I just don't think the format quite landed as well as it possibly could. Mm. The pinnacle of those at the moment is last week tonight with John Oliver who absolutely is amazing at this sort of stuff the only time I sort of see one of them types of shows is when there's like a 10 minute segment of something particular pops up on YouTube let's say so like when they had um, on Jonathan Ross when like Bella Ramsey was on there or something she talked about Last of Us for 5-10 minutes and I, I would like check those bits out I, I'm much more likely to do that than actually watch like the whole things that is the case with this show as well there were there are segments of it that were up on YouTube and in the same way that they put bits of The Daily Show up and they put bits mm. of Last Week Tonight up. So I'm sure John Oliver will pop up somewhere else again because, you know, he's John Oliver, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, there'll be no season three of it on Apple. Moving on to the renewals, Sweet Magnolia is renewed for season four by Netflix, so that will be coming back. Gen V renewed for season two on Prime Video. We're actually just about getting to the, the episode this week I can actually dive back into because we were given the first six episodes on preview. So I, I've been waiting patiently for it to, uh, <laughs> to, to come around so I can watch the last couple of episodes. It's the same with Lower Decks. I think Lower Decks has just hit the point where 
the last few episodes were missing off the preview things. So I think probably so we couldn't accidentally spoil anything. This week, I think both of those shows are now caught up to the point where I can jump back into them, which I'm really looking forward to because I, I love both of them. But yeah, Gen V, I think, has been great. I'm looking forward to, to jumping back on that. Fake or Fortune is brewing new for season 12 on the BBC. So uh, that will be coming back. And the Hit List has been renewed for season seven on the BBC as well. In pick up some other news, who wants to be a millionaire? You may have seen things after the whole Clarkson, Meghan Markle debacle. There was talk of them cancelling it or changing the host. Not true. Apparently, they are. Well, ITV have basically said the, uh, they, they are contractually committed, whether they like it or not, to making more seasons of it. So, uh, who wants to be a millionaire? Due to the rugby, there won't be a season this year because it wouldn't. The rugby is airing when it would normally be on. So they've pushed this season, which has already been recorded. That's been pushed to 2024. So that's going there. Shetland, the uh, drama now has an air date. This has got Ashley Jensen as the new lead. That's coming Wednesday, the 1st of November at 9pm on BBC One. So that's returning. And uh, NCIS Sydney now has a home as well. This is the latest NCIS spinoff. It's the first one that's not based (laughs) in America. Friday, the 10th of November. It's on Paramount Plus UK. Cue a lot of people going, oh, why can't they all be in one place? And yes, I know it's annoying. Although in this particular case, it was specifically co-commissioned by Paramount Plus. So it's not entirely unsurprising that Paramount Plus are the people that are airing it internationally. Uh, I think it was originally made for Network 10, who I think were the people that originally had Neighbours. <laughs> they picked this up. It's only a 10-episode season. It's not like a full 22-episode run. But Paramount stepped in as as the partners for it, so they're actually airing it internationally. I think it's going out on CBS in the US, but it is going out on the same day everywhere as well I think NCIS Sydney will be landing on Paramount Plus UK over on Disney Plus they announced their November dates and there was some good things popping up there Solar Opposites finally back for its full season that's on the 1st of November they haven't specifically said that this is dropping as a box set but it rather looks like it probably is because that will be after it's all aired in the US so we don't know but the way it was sort of phrased it sounded like it was dropping as a box set so we'll see i could be wrong on that but first of november for that and that of course is the first one to have uh, dan stevens doing the voice of corvo as a replacing justin roland who of course has now left the role corvo now has a british accent which uh, unlike rick and morty where they basically replaced them with sound alikes they completely changed the voice of corvo and basically said yeah he's got a british accent now here yeah, whatever <laughs> so what actually happened to like he got accused of that stuff and then they parted ways. Did we have an update after that? Because I didn't, I just heard that like, oh, they were replacing him for these roles and then it went dead silent. It should be pointed out that no criminal charges were ever filed against him. Uh huh for any of that stuff but it does rather sound that from the reports he was allegedly kind of a bit of a dick in the office and wasn't really turning up wasn't really doing an awful lot other than strolling in recording some voices and strolling out again in terms of the actual creative process it sounds like according to a lot of the reports that they were alleging that he wasn't really there very much other than to provide the voice so he sort of fell out with them yeah and although there weren't any charges actually but by that point they'd already severed all connection with him anyway and to be fair so he'd not had really any involvement in the writing of the show for a number of years by the sounds of it he was really only doing the voices I mean I don't know what will happen moving forward but um, mm. they've done a reasonable job in finding replacements for the voices for Rick and Morty apparently it was getting hammered on I don't know Rotten Tomatoes or something for this latest season but I don't see why because there's very little difference between what I saw for the opening couple of episodes and certainly I mean unless you're really listening for it you can't tell the difference in the voice so are opposites mm. slightly different because of the fact that the voice is it's Dan Stevens and he's English and he, Corvo will have an English accent so you know so just- Justin was doing the voices that they replaced. Mm -hmm. Dan Harmon did the writing, wasn't it? Well, yes and no. Both of them sort of set up the show. I don't think either of them have that much day-to-day control at Mm. this point. I don't think either of them are are actually writing that much directly. They may be, I mean, Dan may be popping up and doing bits and pieces, but I I don't think, I mean, 
mean, it was alleged that Justin really had no involvement other than doing the voices at that point. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Dan had an awful lot of involvement. It's been written by a lot of other people pretty much for the last few seasons. Okay. You shouldn't really see a huge amount of difference as far as I can tell. I just kind of had wondered what happened to uh, Justin because after that news came out, like he just sort of disappeared. Keeping a low profile, I think, at the moment. Other air dates for Disney+, Plus: American Horror Story Season 3, that now has a date of the 29th of November. I really like, fell off of them shows. Like I, I relatively enjoyed that sixth part of Season 10. Then Season 11 came out and I was like, oh, okay. And then I never clicked play. And then I watched Stories. That second season was just horribly bad. And then I, I knew it got renewed for a third season. And it, it sounds like some people have kind of dropped off from these shows a bit, but there is still loads of these seasons going around. So maybe I'll jump back in at one point, but I don't know. My enthusiasm for them sort of got killed a little bit yeah. in, the, in the last couple of seasons. I've seen a few people saying that they're loving season 11 or whatever it is of American Horror Story, the one that's out at the moment. They're saying yeah, that, I think that's, it's 11 been quite good don't know what this season will be american horror stories season three but 29th of november on disney plus if you want to go and check that one out and reservation dogs season three that's on the 29th of november that's the third and final season of reservation dogs that's on disney plus as well moving on to a little bit of strike news as the sag afra strike hits i'd hit day 100 at this point they have announced that they are returning back to negotiations because you've Remember last week, the um, Hollywood side walked away from the tables. Well, the claim was that SAG wanted to a levy on subscribers, was how they put it, of between 53 cents and 75 cents, depending on who you believe. In fact, it was probably quite a lot less than that. SAG say the number is intentionally misrepresented to the press, overstating the cost of the proposal by about 60%. So they were trying to say that basically every year that SAG Union wanted to charge 50 60 cents per subscriber on a streaming service and they're going oh no we can't afford that that's appalling that's terrible should be noted that this week netflix just raised its prices by a pound in the uk to the basic rate and two pounds to the premium rate and that's without the fact that they're giving any more money to the actors so on one hand they're going oh no it's terrible we're all poor which is complete rubbish as we know <laughs> i'm walking away from these the negotiations saying that trying to charge customers directly to pay the actors for the content that they're creating would be a step too far <laughs> sorry but these two things just don't balance at all it's, yeah. it's ridiculous and it was the hollywood side that walked out of those talks and like sat on them for a week or so they are going back in and talking again hopefully they'll get further this time without the hollywood producers all throwing their toys out of the pram once again on the other potential strike as well with the video game industry sag have resumed talks with the video game industry to try and avoid another strike there because i mean a lot of the issues with the video game industry are very similar to the issues with tv in terms of ai and image rights and all that sort of stuff so they are talking both to the Hollywood producers and hopefully we'll get a bit more of a resolution there and they are back talking to the game industry and that's been going on for ages those talks on and off talks but they've been off for a while so at least they're going back there was one other little thing that came out which very funny it's obviously Halloween coming up and sag issued some guidance on Halloween costumes telling actors not to wear costumes that are from Struck Productions so going out wearing a Netflix Witcher costume say or a Deadpool costume from the movie something like that mm-hmm. Ryan Reynolds then tweeted out I look forward to screaming scab at my eight year old all night she's not in a union but she needs to learn <laughs> which SAG later clarified that they're only issuing this rule against actors and not their children <laughs> I'd hope so children can wear whatever they like what they're basically saying is don't wear costumes for shows that they're striking against basically and because it would be seen as promotion if you take photos and post them on social media and all that sort of stuff I love Ryan Reynolds and I love that tweet I mean <laughs> it's hilarious corporate greed's a nasty nasty thing yes I've seen greed from all different sides of the industry whether it's tv films football obviously don't get me started on that but uh (laughs) it's gotten particularly obviously worse since the whole i mean ai has been around for 
obviously a long time, but this recent kind of thing with it. I saw some footage, by the way, put together. I don't know how real or fake it actually was, and it, it wasn't like major important. And it kind of had this mock up kind of thing of if we went back to do Stranger Things season five with AI, and not from writing, but from the actor's point of view, this is what it would look like. <laughs> and it just looked like a video game that was in extremely early production or something. Right. And it's like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> no one's no one's going to watch that. At the end of the day, hopefully actors get fair pay. That's what we want and need. Yeah. Um, lit- it's literally what some people need because obviously to be able to live and do what they do. As I said, corporate greed is just a nasty thing and it's a shame that it's gotten this far, really. Yeah. The streaming is the bigger problem at the moment. Mm-hmm. And it's those that are... It's the same with the writers. It's those that are holding things up and it's those that are causing problems because the contracts were made prior to streaming basically becoming as dominant as it has. And it's the fact that, you know, we were talking about 24 episode seasons with like Frasier and the latest season, which is on streaming is 10 episodes. That massive reduction in the number of episodes obviously has an effect on how much money the actors can make. So you've got a lot of these issues coming to the fore, not just in the fact that they're ordering less episodes. The way the residuals are split for streaming isn't fair. And it's all that sort of stuff that they're trying to work out so we'll see where they get to this time around but at least they are talking again which is good moving on to some other news stories there was a couple of uh, interesting new shows that have been ordered one of them is for NBC in America so doesn't have a UK date yet but it, I thought it sounded kind of interesting particularly if you like medical drama it's based around the story of the late neurologist Oliver Sacks whose name you might not know but you may be aware of some of his work it's called Dr. Wolf. It's going to star Zachary Quinto, who you'll know as, as Spock from the Star Trek movies, the one that isn't Leonard Nimoy, and Heroes, an American horror story, of course. So he's going to take the lead role of Dr. Wolf. Wolf follows revolutionary larger than life neurologist Oliver Wolf and his team of interns as they explore the last great frontier, the human mind, while also grappling with their own relationships and mental health. It's based on a series of books that were written by the real life neurologist Oliver Sacks called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and An Anthropologist on Mars. Oliver Sacks passed away in 2015 at the age of 82 but he's described by the New York Times as the poet laureate of medicine. He wrote about various conditions that were incredibly misunderstood at the time, things like Tourette's syndrome, aphasia, autism, those sort of things, and became the godfather of what is now known as neurodiversity. He was also the author of the book Awakenings, which actually followed his genuine real-life work on this strange case of finding a bunch of people who were in frozen and states unable to initiate movement and he found a way of waking them up and this became the basis for Awakenings the movie which got Oscar nominated which starred Robert De Niro and Robin Williams which is a beautiful and brilliant film if you've never seen it he wrote the original source material that that movie was the dramatised version of I think he's a fascinating guy there is I mean his entire career is full of these really interesting neurology cases there's been a number of attempts to to bring this guy's work to dramatization on TV. This iteration that they finally got to comes from Michael Grassi, who's worked on, uh, well, Riverdale, but we'll skip over that. Lost Girl and Shit's Creek, he also worked on. It's from Belanti Productions. So uh, it's Greg mm. Belanti. Um, Shit's Creek is good. Yes, it's from Belanti Productions. It's also got involvement from the Imagitarium, which is Andy Circus's company. They've jumped on board as well, and uh, Fable Entertainment, as well as also the people that are involved and uh, it's in association with Warner Brothers and Universal Television which means that there's no obvious place where it would land over here because if it was all entirely universal you could say well that's most likely to land on Sky but the fact that it's a co-production with Warner Brothers means it could basically go anywhere 
but it does feel like something that really, really could land on Sky Witness. It's that right. sort of level yeah. of medical drama, I think. Seems like a fascinating story. It feels like it could be a bit sort of house-esque, maybe. Certainly it's in that kind of area of House the Good Doctor, you know, that sort right. of medical drama, yeah. I would have thought. It's called Dr. Wolf. We'll keep an eye out for it. It will be landing hopefully next year, assuming they get all this strike stuff sorted out. Of course, yeah. Zachary uh, Quinto's great in basically every role that I've seen him in. <laughs> That's obviously a good choice, first of all, and it sounds good. So, like I said, we'll just see where it lands. But it sounds like a uh, promising one, hopefully. There could be one to look out for, certainly that, but it's called uh, Dr. Wolf, that one. Back over in the UK, there is uh, some interesting Arthur Conan Doyle content coming. The first one being uh, Mark Gattis, who is actually producing a thing for Christmas. It's a new Christmas ghost story based on Arthur Conan Doyle's lot number 249, which was a short story of his. Mark Gaddis has done Christmas ghost stories the last few years, so this is going to be the latest one. It's the first time he's actually done a Conan Doyle one, and of course he knows Conan Doyle very well because he co-created Sherlock. He's obviously a big fan of his work, and I think he, you know, he's, he's looking to, to do this. It revolves around a group of students at Oxford, one of whom undertakes research into the secrets of ancient Egypt and becomes the talk of the college. He expects sort of creepy mummies and that sort of thing in this, but uh, I'm sure it'd be wonderful, but he's producing that for the BBC. It's going to be starring Kit Harrington of Game of Thrones and Eternals fame, and uh, Freddie Fox, who you might know from Slow Horses. I think he's also in House of the Dragon and The Crown as well. Great cast for that and going to be coming this Christmas don't know exactly when but it will be some point over Christmas I mean it's kind of late for announcing it yet uh, I don't know whether they've started yeah. shooting it already <laughs> but I, I don't think October is so. quite late, late for I hope they've started shooting it but yeah. yeah some good names in there so we'll see what that one's like there is another Conan Doyle thing coming which they haven't announced exactly when this is dropping but it's called Killing Sherlock it's from Lucy Walsley who is the historian author and presenter the this unearths Sherlock's origins in Conan Doyle's early life as a medical student, unpicks the, his early stories and reveals the dark underbelly of late Victorian Britain from drug use to true crime. She explores Doyle's growing disenchantment with his detective creation and desire to distance himself from Sherlock and taking the role of detecting himself in one of the most important legal cases of the 20th century. I'm not sure which case she's talking about there, but if it is the one I think it is, it's the one Conan Doyle was involved in a case which was actually in the village that I grew up in. So <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so it may be that one. I don't know. But I think that sounds like it's kind of interesting. Certainly if you're a Sherlock Holmes fan, that's going to be called Killing Sherlock. Lots of sort of background about the story between sort of Conan Doyle and Sherlock is going to be quite interesting. Don't know exactly when that's landing yet, but it's it's going to be made for the BBC at some point in the future. So a couple of interesting Conan Doyle things there for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. That's everything we've got this week. Just some time for some highlights for next week on TV. <laughs> So, highlights for next week. We have What We Do in the Shadows returning for its fifth season. That's on 25th of October. That will be back on Disney+. Plus. A League of Their Own season 18. That comes to Skymax on the 25th of October at 9pm. London Kills returns at, uh, there's another daytime soap actually, uh, BBC One at the 27th of October at 1.45pm. South Park has a new special coming. That's coming to Paramount Plus. That's on the 28th of October. Survivor UK appears this season one. I think we had a Survivor years ago, but um, Survivor UK season one, BBC one, 28th of October at 8. 25. That's the reality competition which tests brains, brawn and betrayal as players compete to outwit, outplay and outlast their rivals to be crowned ultimate survivor. Old Domit, I think, is the, the sort of ringmaster for that. Fellow Travellers, which is a limited series coming to Paramount Plus based on a novel. It's an epic love story and political thriller chronicling the clandestine romance of two very different men in McCarthy era Washington. Time, season two, which, I mean, there's trailers all over the place for this. This is the Jimmy McGovern drama, which returns for a second season, this time set in a women's prison. Bella Ramsey in this with uh, Jodie Whittaker, 29th of October at 9pm on BBC One for Time, season two. 
The Gilded Age returns for its second season. That's the Julian Fallows, Downton Abbey guy drama. That's coming to Sky Atlantic on the 30th of October at 9pm. And Gremlins Secret of the Mogwai, which is an animated prequel to the Gremlins movies, coming to BBC Three on the 30th of October at 7pm. It will all be on iPlayer from that date as well, so you'll be able to go and check it out there. That's everything for this week. If people want to find more of you, where can they find you? You can find me over on Entertainment talk.org or your podcast platforms of choice uh, tv games films main night podcasts lots of stuff was going on the last couple of days we unfortunately did lose sir bobby charlton yes over the weekend which is very sad one of the of course well w- one of the biggest legends ever for manchester united and british one of the, football one of the, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that as well with the world cup and stuff uh, one of the trinity as well of course law best and and charlton so very very sad to lose him of course uh, thankfully we did win on the same day we beat sheffield united made it very difficult for ourselves but we got there in the end so that was uh, some good stuff as well did a whole bunch of stuff over the weekend I did a, a Disney podcast talking about their live action stuff I did a Pixar podcast talking about what's going on with them I talked about Netflix because they raised their prices and posed the question of what is Netflix offering us I reviewed the David Beckham documentary which was very very good good sort of nostalgic look back at those glorious 90s era and all the treble and all that kind of stuff the only treble that an English team has won um, so I've got that going on <laughs> Uh, we recently wrapped up with Breaking Bad Season 3 which is good to do still got gaming talk and um, also another video game adaption comes out this week Five Nights at Freddy's which will be good for I guess Halloween and stuff that mm-hmm. comes out so I should be checking that out you can follow me as well if you want to on Twitter there's all sorts of updates and bits and pieces and stuff uh, that's eTalk UK over on Twitter but that is me excellent should also mention as well I will be down at MCM Comic Con which is back in London this weekend from Friday to Sunday so uh, if you see me wandering around i will probably be wearing a geek town t-shirt so you probably should be able to spot me <laughs> um but uh nice. yeah i will be around at mcm over the weekend so uh you can go and find me there for other people involved in the show you can find bex at twitch.tv forward slash trista bytes that's b-y-t-e-s she's uh streaming every week over on her twitch channel go and check her out she's very very funny over on there and daryl you can find at hollywoodnorthnews.net for all the tv series you love which are shot in canada for us you can go to the website at geektown.co.uk throughout the week and see the latest air date information if you want to get in touch with your questions or comments email us on podcast at geektown.co.uk leave a message on the website post find us at geektown on x or twitter on facebook at facebook.com forward slash geektown on youtube at youtube.com forward slash geektown on blue sky at geektown on instagram at geektown uk on tiktok at geektown uk and on threads at geektown uk that is everything we shall see you next week bye bye goodbye